This is the introductory set of slides that I gave to a talk to uh, students interested in pluralist economics in Thuringia in Germany just the last week. And as part of it, I'm teaching them how to use Minsky. And to make that possible, they need to have Minsky installed. Minsky, of course, is still open source. It always will be open source. But uh, these days, both to help us form a user community and to raise a small amount of money for uh, developing Minsky, we're now having the compiled versions only on Patreon at the website you can see on your screen right now. So first thing I got them to do was to download and install Minsky after signing up to the Patreon page. If you'd like to use Minsky as well, then unless you're a Patreon of mine on uh, Prof. Steve Keen, uh, you'd need to sign up to the Minsky page, which uh, can cost you the princely sum of as little as one dollar a month, and it gives us some funds to develop Minsky further. It certainly covers the cost of uh, producing the compiled versions uh, for users who don't compile their own code. This is the uh, page for Minsky. Dr. Russell Standish is the chief programmer of Minsky. I'm the chief designer. And the latest version we have as a release version is version 2.15, which is downloadable from uh, the Minsky's page there. The latest beta is 2.15.7. And uh, of course, the beta has more features, but it also has more bugs. And one bug that got in the way of the talk here was uh, that occasionally, depending on scaling, plots would appear blank rather than filled out. So I got students to install both versions. I also recommend anybody wants to learn dynamics properly, don't learn it from an economist, learn it from a mathematician. And uh, this superb book by uh, John Blatt, who was uh, until his until his death, professor of economics, uh, sorry, professor of mathematics, much more useful discipline, professor of mathematics at the University of New South Wales. Uh, very uh, interesting mathematician who, when he was first exposed to what was called economics uh, by attending a seminar by an economist at the University of New South Wales, was so horrified by what uh, the, math, the economist thought was mathematics that he said he was going to go and see where economists went wrong and started all from the beginning. I think that's probably still the best, in my opinion, the best introduction to uh, mathematical dynamics uh, available, done by a mathematician, not by an economist. And uh, until such time as it's out of print, or rather when it ceases being out of print, I'll take it off my website, but I have a, a version there for the, for the to make up for the fact that at the moment you can't purchase a copy anywhere in the world. So I want to cover for in, in the course first of all, and that's made mainly this particular talk, I'm re-recording it because there was a stuff up in the recording at the uh, the live one, of course. Uh, these, these things happen. Is a brief history of what you might call the non-history of dynamics and economics. Uh, why is it being stuck with what they think is dynamics in the neoclassical school, which any, any proper mathematician scoffs at. Uh, then I have a brief approach overview of approaches to modeling, very brief, and a quick introduction to Minsky talk about the economy as a complex system, and then show system dynamics modeling using Minsky. And then the, the two main topics I cover in the, in the, in the main lectures are the uh, macroeconomic modeling, which I start with uh, the model by uh, Richard Goodwin, which he called a growth cycle, which he wrote back in 1967. Then I go to my extension to Minsky, and the question mark is that, of course, much more development uh, is both needed and uh, is fe feasible using modern system dynamics. And then monetary modelling, and there I start with the work of Basil Moore, uh, informed by the brilliant analysis of what it actually means to call an economy a monetary economy, done by the uh, Italian economist Augusto Graziani, and then of course the work of Wynne Godley, which uh, uh, my uh, Minsky software recognises by calling its double entry bookkeeping tables Godley tables. So this is John Blatt talking about dynamic economics in 1983. And he said, from the time of Adam Smith, economic theory has developed in terms of an almost universal concentration of thought and effort on the study of equilibrium states. And if anything, it's got worse since Blatt wrote those words over 30 years ago. And he said these might be static or there might be cases of proportional growth or balanced growth. And what he calls truly dynamic phenomena uh, have been pushed to the sidelines. And why might you defend doing it? Well, you can say that uh, uh, statics is, e is easier. It's, uh, and a good understanding of statics is necessary before you can learn dynamics. In fact, that's something which Marshall himself claimed over a century ago. 
and then well even though you're not actually in equilibrium you're not going to be too far from it so you can treat treat the deviations as, as minor perturbations and that market fluctuate prices fluctuate around natural prices and you could determine those ignore directly and ignore the fluctuations altogether and work as if equilibrium attained throughout and Blatt argues and I certainly agree with him here that this sort of argument made sense two centuries ago one and a half centuries ago in particular when the uh, neoclassical school first developed but it doesn't make any sense now from his point of view as a, a, as a highly qualified and uh, highly respected mathematician is that what's happening now what he saw back in 1983 was more like a grown-up man crawling uh, and I th when he wrote when I first read these words I thought this was a nice hyperbole 30 years later as we approach an ecological crunch I think it might actually be a seriously prophetic statement. At this present, the state, the state of our dynamic economics is more akin to a crawl than a walk, to say nothing of a run. Indeed, some may think that capitalism as a social system may disappear before its dynamics are understood by economists. So, have things improved? Well, back when Blatt wrote, the, the main form of so-called equilibrium modelling by uh, economists was using what they call computable general equilibrium or CGE models. They are now pretty much defunct, though there are certainly plenty of functional CGE models around. Virtually no student gets a PhD these days by building a CGE model. Uh, instead, they've got the, what they call real business cycle models, RBC, and dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, uh, DSGE. And they think this is the ants' pants. This is Chari speaking before, of all things, the uh, United States Congress or a subcommittee of the Congress after the uh, 2008 financial crisis, justifying why economists did not see that crisis coming. And uh, he, he, this, this is the typical attitude of a lot of neoclassicals. Any interesting model of the economy must be a dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium model. There is no other, no other game in town. And he said, if you don't do a DSGME, then you're basically obfuscating. You're not explaining how you put your model together. Uh, and this wonderful final statement, or useful aphorism, if you have an interesting and coherent story to tell, you can tell it in a DSGME model. If you cannot, your story is incoherent. Well, at the same hearing, uh, the, fortunately, the committee invited more than one person. And they invited Robert Sola, of course, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize in economics. And... Uh, well known for his sarcastic wit and at the same time a traditional mainstream economist and he said that he, in general he wasn't too uh, disappointed with the state of neoclassical economics but to him every proposition must pass the smell test does this really make sense and in his opinion DSG models do not pass the still smell sense smell test pardon me he says they take for granted that a whole economy can be thought about as if it were a single consistent person or dynasty carrying out a rationally designed long-term plan occasionally disturbed by unexpected shocks but adapting to them in a rational consistent way now I know plenty of neoclassicals will stay straight away oh we have heterogeneous agents these days ha um, it's a tiny modification to that foundation and the foundation remains uh, and he maybe uh, solo says he doesn't think it passes the smell test and I couldn't agree with them more in the final statement. The advocates no doubt believe what they say, but they seem to have stopped sniffing or have lost their sense of smell altogether. And Roma, writing, uh, there was of course a very recent Nobel Prize winner, 2018, wrote that for more than three decades, macroeconomics has gone backwards. Um, There's the, a the, the couple of technical comments there, but if you take a look at what's being said, they, they, they attribute fluctuations in aggregate variables to imaginary causal forces that are not influenced by the action that any person takes. And you can see that in a model I'll discuss later in this lecture series uh, where uh, uh, Peter Ireland uh, fits a DSGE model to the uh, 2008 financial crisis and claims that he manages to explain it. Uh, and he makes a parallel to string theory where you have elaborate theories uh, highly regarded individual leaders but no chance to uh, test the theory uh, by any empirical means. Now that's not at all what the founders of neoclassical economics expected to see by the 21st century. If you look back at the work of Jevons, Volras, Marshall and so on, they saw 
uh, e equilibrium methods as a stopgap. And this is Jevons in 1871 saying if we wish to have a complete solution we should have to treat it as a problem of dynamics. But it would be surely it should, but it would surely be absurd to attempt the more difficult question when the more easy one is yet so imperfectly within our power. Marshall, writing in 1907, said that dynamics include statics, but the static solution is simpler. And this is the point Blatt uh, said was the justification back then. It may afford useful preparation and training for the more difficult dynamical solution. In fact, that's not the case. Uh, and it may be the first step towards a provisional and partial solution in problems so complex that a complete dynamical solution is beyond our attainment. Now, as, as Blatt commented, that was a valid uh, argument to have uh, back in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, not at the beginning of the 21st. John Bates Clark wrote a, 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 um, a effective forecast of what he thought would happen with economics in 1898 and what he said was that there was a bit like physics at the same time conventional economists thought they'd solved most of the problems and it was just a case of tidying up some of the statements of principles uh, and he said no the great coming development meaning in the 20th century uh, will be through the statement and solution of dynamic problems now instead they never got there they again I think the whole description of current models is dynamic and uh, and general is wrong. They are stochastic equilibrium models. They're not at all dynamic and they're not at all general. And why, why has this happened? Why have we not got past the static equilibrium foundations? Well, there are many issues in equilibrium economics which have not worked out the way neoclassicals hoped they would. So there's a quite a complex mathematical theorem called the, I, let's see how the translation handles this, peron Frobenius theorem. That's pretty damn good. I'm impressed. Uh, on the dominant eigenvalue of a positive semi-definite matrix. What has that got to do with economics? Take a look at chapter 7 of Blatt and you'll see why. It shows that these it's atonement process that Walrus thought would lead to... Hang on, okay. The atonement process. Close, close. Uh, I'm enjoying watching the text come up here, by the way. Uh, this is a new feature in PowerPoint, which I'm, I'm, I must say I'm quite impressed by. Uh, okay, the peron frobenius theorem shows that what Walras, W-A-L-R-A-S, oh well, <laughs> you win some, you lose some, uh, the process he thought would bring a set of all markets to equilibrium by a process of groping is actually mathematically unstable. And the consumption field, we have the sun and shine. Yes, I'm impressed. Sun and shine, Mantel. De Bruyne. Close. Theorem on the impossibility of deriving a downward sloping individual demand curve uh, from individuals to themselves. Oh, sorry, downward sloping market demand curve. Um, okay, I've got an error in the text there, but I'll fix it up later. Um, <laughs> pardon me. I'm being cracked up by some of the errors in the transcription, but my God, it's good. Okay, uh, the Sonnenschein Mantel de Bruyne theorem is the theorem developed by neoclassical economists themselves, asking themselves whether if you had a whole lot of individuals who each obeyed the what's called the law of demand, so their so-called Hicksian compensated demand curves slope downwards, uh, if you sum those up, do you get a downward sloping market demand curve? And the answer is no, unless you assume two things. One, all consumers are identical, and more importantly, more absurdly, all commodities are identical. So that sort of uh, ruins the whole idea of market demand curves, which of course are still taught ad nauseum in undergraduate uh, microeconomics. And I think, as Yanis Varoufakis argues to some extent, the fact that these equilibrium failures occurred has actually cemented equilibrium thinking into neoclassical thought. They actually think that you have to be doing equilibrium work to be doing economics, uh, which I think is the exact opposite of the truth. And here again, look back at Shari. Any interesting model must be a dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium model. There's no other game in town. But Irving Fisher, back in the 1930s, uh, who actually was also as, as strict a believer in assuming equilibrium as Shari was before the 1929 uh, stock market crash, 
wiped him out. He said, yes, OK, the economic system has innumerable variables. Only in imagination can these remain constant and be kept in equilibrium. And he says economic theory does include studies of this imaginary ideal equilibrium system. And notice he says which may be stable or unstable. And that's uh, rather more insight than a lot of neoclassical economists show today. And B, disequilibrium. He said the former is economic static statics, the latter economic dynamic so-called trade theory is merely one part of the study of economic disequilibrium. And I only wish we'd built on Fisher uh, in this way as well as uh, the way that Minsky did to develop the financial instability hypothesis. Hypothesis. Ah. Pardon me, I'm being distracted by the text down a little bit. I'll keep it up. I'm actually quite... Uh, I have to say this is seriously good development in PowerPoint. So, you don't need to assume equilibrium, but economists still do it. And they shoehorn everything into an equilibrium box, even climate change. And uh, just to show this is a quote from somebody I'm, whose work I'm finding quite appalling, uh, above and beyond the fact that he makes equilibrium, uh, builds an equilibrium model. This is Nobel Prize winner Nordhaus, from the, the winner in 2018, uses his model, is DICE stands for Dynamic Integrated Climate and Economics Model, but it's an intertemporal general equilibrium model. Uh, the last type of mechanism you'd, you'd need to use to analyse something as dynamic and disequilibrium based as changing the climate of the planet. Now, in the modern world, we have, with computers, we have a range of modelling techniques that certainly weren't available a century and a half ago when neoclassical economics was being developed. Multi-agent modelling is one of the most popular, and with multi-agent modelling, you can build a model of interacting agents who are not all the same, where the commodities differ, and you don't have the aggregation fallacies that apply to uh, trying to do a, a mathematical aggregation from uh, which neoclassicals continue doing as if it's feasible. Uh, it isn't, but that's what they still do. Uh, but the trouble with multi-agent modelling, it's uh, got a huge programming overhead. Anybody who's actually built a multi-agent model knows that the workload involved in getting the programming right is enormous. And uh, the insights are much, much harder to draw out of that work than people initially hope will be the case. Then there's stock flow consistent modelling using discrete time. We're built on the work of uh, Wynne Godley and Mark Lavoie. And that is both feasible and very popular in non-orthodox economic circles. Uh, but the, what's the reason for using discrete time? Um, the, uh, proponents give a range of reasons. I'm critical virtually of all of them. One of the main ones is that's the way the data comes. Uh, we get population data in discrete chunks as well, but nobody thinks we can model human population as a, as a discrete time process. Uh, what I prefer is system dynamics where you express your dynamic model in a flowchart just to make the mathematics, the, the flow of logic and the mathematics easy to understand. This was developed uh, first back in the mid-1950s by, by Jay Forrester and it has a top-down approach. You, you work at the level of the system and you build uh, the, effectively the constraints the system applies uh, to what's being done inside the system, where that can be any system at all. And I prefer the approach, uh, this approach to both multi-agent modelling and certainly to discrete time modelling uh, because what happens in economics is not uh, coordinated as discrete time argues, it's asynchronous. People make decisions at all sorts of different times and continuous time is the best way to bring that together. And I developed Minsky to make it possible to do monetary system dynamics modelling and that's what I'll be explaining. Uh, in the next set of lectures that this is the, the first introduction to. So Minsky is a software package, is open source, it's available from SourceForge, uh, but if you want the compiled version you have to go to Patreon, uh, where we, we can download a version for Windows or a version for the Macintosh. And there are many system dynamics programs out there. Uh, some of the well-known ones are iThink, Stellar, Vensim, Simulink, uh, Insight Maker, which is uh, which is a free program that runs uh, in your browser. Minsky adds one feature that none of these programs have, and that's the capacity to build models of financial dynamics using double entry bookkeeping. And I name the double entry bookkeeping tables Godly tables in honor of Win Godly. So it has a number of other unique features, relatively unique. Uh, firstly, its design is very much oriented towards mathematics. 
so all the mathematical expressions are shown on the design canvas whereas they're hidden in programs like uh, like Vensim. Uh, and I use the idea of flows and integrals rather than stocks and flows, which uh, flows and stocks rather, which uh, Simulink uses. And the equations are shown on the screen in the same way that Simulink does, rather than in boxes, text boxes, which is the way that programs like Vensim and Stella do it. Uh, we have support for text formatting, which is actually still, to my amazement, it's unique to Minsky. So you can to have superscripts and subscripts using latex commands. So if you type backslash lambda, and that's supposed to be L-A-M-B-D-A, I'll fix that up in a, in a moment, underscore Z, uppercase, that's the, the carrot on top of the six key, curly brackets UK, close curly brackets, that becomes, as you can see, uh, lambda underscore Z, uppercase UK, and that's unique. No other program supports that. We enable you to let to enter equations and variables directly onto the canvas. Again, no program in this uh, product space lets you do that. You have to go and click on a palette to bring down operators. In, uh, in Min Minsky, it's simply a case of if you want to multiply key at some point on the canvas, you just press the asterisk, which is the shortcut on the keyboard, of course, for multiplication. Uh, a very important feature which makes it easier to design complex models and not have a huge mess of what's called spaghetti, spaghetti code on the uh, on the screen is the capacity to pass by name. So you can name a variable GDP for example uh, and then use that GDP anywhere else on the screen rather than having to connect a wire to the one instance of GDP which is the uh, situation for all, all the other uh, system dynamics programs. And graphs are embedded in the canvas and simulated in real time so when you're sim running a model you can actually see the uh, output as time goes on and you can vary parameters dynamically while you're running the model. Then we output to LaTeX for documentation which again is fairly rare. We also outlet, output to MATLAB for analysis and uh, now that we have a research grant to develop the program further we'll be adding output to R and hopefully also input. And the most important feature you can enter stock flow consistent models of financial flows using godly tables. Now the weaknesses. For a start there are lots of bugs and uh, that's really because the tiny amount of money that's gone into Minsky's development. It's d developed by uh, Russell Standish who has who was a commercial programmer these days. He was an associate professor of mathematics at the University of New South Wales until such, uh, such a time as the uh, University of New South Wales and Sydney shut down their high performance computing unit. Um, so he started and is still academic by nature but has to be paid to do coding like Minsky. And I've got a total of about $250,000 worth of funding over the years, which is trivial. It only pays for about two and a half thousand hours of development time. Now, because I said download two versions, the current version and the latest beta. And the latest beta has one significant improvement over the previous beta, and that is it's much easier to select individual items. All you have to do is uh, hold the control key down, click on several icons on the canvas and then click and drag in one of them and you move them all around wherever else you want to put them. It's a simple improvement, it's pretty common in other programs but this is something we didn't have a chance to implement in the earlier version and now we have. Um, and of course as I mentioned the bugs have turned up as well so disappearing plots is one of those. The grouping is also quite poor compared to the standard programs in the industry. We had uh, a clever idea suggested to us of making the groups transparent, uh, but it's still not being properly implemented, so grouping is something which is problematic. And there's no data display widget. You can only see uh, data by either looking at the variable values in each, any uh, variable on screen, which is something again we do that no other program does, or by seeing it in a plot but you don't have the possibility of seeing the data, either the data you're loading into a model to fit parameters or the uh, data being generated by the model. You can't see that in a spreadsheet yet. And it has a non-conformist user interface in many ways. Partly this is just the fact that we had uh, inadequate funding, but also I have my own strong preferences about uh, design features and one thing I will never implement is the ribbon, like the ribbon in Microsoft Windows and PowerPoint. I think it actually makes it harder to use the software rather than having a decent, uh, uh, a decent menu structure. 
Now, good news, and I haven't actually announced this yet because we're still waiting on the paperwork to be finalised by both sides, but we have received a grant of £200,000 from Friends Provident Foundation to improve Minsky. And uh, this is going to be spent over the next year. It'll enable us to hire Russell for uh, pretty much half time for a full year ahead of his commercial programming rates. Uh, we can hire a full time assistant programmer for one year, and we can develop professional documentation at the end, including video guides as well as, uh, as manuals. So it should make Minsky a lot easier to use. Uh, one of the first things we're going to do is to port the user interface from to JavaScript from the currently dated GUI it uses, which is called TCLTK, and that'll enable the Minsky to be run in a browser, as well as having installed it and running on a standalone basis on your own PC. And we'll do a lot of conversion of the clunkier aspects of the user face to uh, standard approaches these days. Much better graphs are going to come. There will be a data display table. And the most important thing in terms of pushing the, the boundaries of Minsky will be integrating the analysis of energy and ecology into economics via a grant that I've received from the Rebuilding Macro uh, Economics Program of the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK. OK, here's Minsky's interface. And I'll have to run this little movie here to illustrate what happens. Down here, you've got a design canvas. Somewhere in here is where you place your objects and define your model that way. This is where the mathematical operators are. Um, this is where you run the record and rewind and, and play and rewind buttons. Here you control the simulation and zoom and change the scale of what you see on the canvas. At the moment, uh, we've got grouping. As you can see, if you press on the plus key at the top of the menu, then you get a drop down showing you all the various similar mathematical operators. Um, this is. Uh, it helps because of the sheer scale, but it's confusing. So we're going to be adding extra op options for layout as well. And of course, as I've said, you can enter most of the operators you need directly onto the canvas without needing to go up to the palette. Now you'll find bugs. So if you sign up and if you follow what I'm the lecture I'm giving here, uh, please sign up to the SourceForge beta program for Minsky and report the bugs that you find. Now, the basic thing in, for those who haven't seen system dynamics beforehand, the basic story is you use wires to define equations. So let's just take a look at, ah, hang on. What happened there? Pardon me, I'm going to go back and I thought, there we go. Click on the movie over here. Let's take a look at that. So click on variable. That gives you three choices, variable, constant, or parameter. If I define a flow here, and I make a couple of mistakes in this muck around, but I'll, I'll let you see it happen. So I describe that as GDP. It's a flow. I can then just come down on the keyboard and type V. Of course, what I should have typed here is A for labor productivity. I simply put the wrong one in before I realized what I was doing. So this is the capital output ratio. And then I should have, you'll see me make a little error here. I now want to have a divide by key. Wire up GDP, then I'm realized, oops, I meant, I meant, I didn't mean capital output. Drag that over here. I meant labor productivity. So I type A for labor productivity. That's the symbol that Goodwin uses in his um, uh, growth cycle model. Give an initial value, one widget per worker. You can give a range and step size, so you can change this during a simulation if you feel so inclined. And then if I attach A to the bottom of the divide by key and over here type L for labor, and I then drag the wire from the beginning of the, the, front, the front to the back, what you get is there's your equation. So it's basically the same as writing equations, only using a flow chart rather than the equal sign and so on to, um, to show your overall mathematics. Now the integral block is an essential part of these models. Integrals 
take an incoming flow like for example investment and convert that into a stock, in that case capital. And the reason that these programs use integration is that differentiation, which is the way the models are actually expressed, mathematically is a much more unstable operation than integration. If you imagine walking along a hill, it's going to be going up and down all the way. You're going to rise and fall, uh, ups and downs as you, as you walk up and down the path. So the slope of the hill is changing very rapidly. But the integral, the area beneath the, that you've walked, changes much more slowly. So integration is more numerically stable and that's why integrals are used instead. Okay, so that's here's a quick little movie of using Minsky uh, this way. So let's just hit the run button of the movie. I make a couple of mistakes here but that's actually useful to teach from. So I've brought down an integral block. I'm now changing the default name of INT1 to K for capital. Drag it up a bit. Divide K by V, the capital output ratio. Attach that to Y, so I've now defined output properly in the Goodwin model. And you'll now find Y is now K divided by V, but DK DT is equal to zero. I need to bring in gross investment, so I click and hold the shift key down and uh, drag, drag the mouse to move the whole canvas across. Define I underscore G, or I lowercase g, as initial as, as gross investment. Give it a label. Click on OK. And now I want to have depreciation in there as well. So I need to take a copy of K. And then I type on the keyboard, it's on just on the canvas, slash backslash delta underscore K, which will give me the Greek letter delta lowercase, uh, and, then un un and then subscript K. I give it a value of 0 0.06, which means 6% depreciation per year. Click on OK. Type a multiply block, so I multiply the two together. Drag from the little circle at the front there to attach them. If you don't get the circle properly, you move the object around. So I've now got depreciation. I need to type a minus key so I can subtract depreciation from gross investment. I made a mistake that I didn't actually notice recording the movie. I hadn't corrected it properly. So when you t go back and take a look at the equation now, you see I've got dkdt equals ig minus zero. So I realized my mistake by checking the equations. Come back and now wire that up properly, but I thought first of all, let's whack in uh, k underscore zero, k subscript zero as the initial value of capital, capital stock. So I give it a value of 300. Type in uh, an initial capital stock as a label. And I can place it on the canvas and then right click and choose to make a copy and paste that somewhere on the canvas. You're forever moving stuff around to get wires uh, in better locations. You'll see me doing a bit of that here. So I've now given an initial condition and I've got gross investment to find. I control click on each of those three icons and then drag them over a bit so I can drag up from the, the output of the multiply key to the bottom of the minus sign and then right click and choose flip to turn that around to make it a bit neater in terms of layout. Rearrange things a bit and then go and check the equations and I've now got capital and defined as gross investment minus depreciation output as capital divided by labour stock and L as labour is output divided by labour productivity. And to go on further, click on to the next lecture.